starts right now. The counting continues in the race for the White House is a race that is now stretching into at least another day. Yeah, let's take a look at the latest results tonight. The goal again is 270 electoral votes. Here's what the Associated Press is reporting tonight. Joe Biden standing at 264, President Donald Trump at 214. We are keeping an eye on a number of states tonight, including Nevada, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, and Georgia, even though the Associated Press called Arizona that state still very much in play tonight as well. ABC News has not called Arizona yet, so stay tuned. One of those states that could push Biden over the top to become the next president, Trump, would need all four states that on this map are still outstanding. We're going to continue to follow these results as they come in. And while the races are not over, there's several, there have already been several lawsuits from the Trump campaign. The president's called to stop counting legitimate ballots overnight sparked worry. It's why some voters voice their concern in downtown San Antonio. The night team's Tiffany Huertas met with them and took a look at how this historic election could impact future political races. They're trying to take away the votes. A call for concern. People in downtown San Antonio calling to protect the results after what was heard overnight. We want all voting to stop. We don't want them to find any ballots at four o'clock in the morning and add them to the list. Okay. The mail-in ballots this year came overwhelmingly and I think our nation needs to honor that. Despite what the president said, election officials continue to count votes across the country. In Bear County, about 1,000 mail ballots were expected today. You can't stop the count. St. Mary's University professor emeritus Henry Flores has a background in election law. He believes the president is trying to cast doubt. The people decide the outcome of election, not a court, not, a, not the legislative body not any one particular politician, the people. And that's the way the Supreme Court views these, these elections. He says each county has a set of standards to make sure an election runs smoothly. They've got one person that opened the envelope to, and verifies the ballot and then stacks them in such, such a way that they feed them into the, into the machines, the scanning machines to read them. And all those people are trained and all those people have been uh, you know, pass some, some sort of background check. With the race winding closer to an end, some races could be considered close in ballot count. You can pretty much uh, consider that a candidate is going to call for a recount and there will be lawyers present. President Donald Trump's campaign has already filed lawsuits in Pennsylvania, Michigan and Georgia. As far as what's to be expected for future elections, Florida says legal teams will likely play a bigger role in election planning. And for voters, more may be taking the early vote option. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. Turning now to the coronavirus pandemic, a slight dip in our seven day average in Bear County, but it remains above the 200 mark tonight. Five new deaths also reported today and confirmed and 185 new cases were also reported today. In our hospitals, another increase 255 COVID-19 patients are in the hospital, 15 more than last night. 110 are now in the intensive care unit. That's also up 56 are on ventilators. City officials reminding you to follow all the safety precautions to avoid spreading the virus any further. And a day after coming out on top in the race for Bear County Commissioner of Precinct 3, Trish DeBerry already making plans. One priority, helping small business owners amid the pandemic. The night team's Jaffney Gray with how she hopes to accomplish more relief for those who are suffering. You know, during this pandemic, nobody has suffered more than small businesses. And so hopefully when I get into the seat and I'm sworn in in January, I'm going to make that a laser focus of mine. Commissioner-elect for Bear County Precinct 3, Trish DeBerry, is ready to hit the ground running for local small business owners hit hard by the coronavirus. With over 20 years experience as a small business owner herself, DeBerry says she knows what it's like battling an economic downturn. You know, it's hiring freezes. It's salary freezes, um, it's cutting discretionary spending, and what does that look like? When she officially takes her seat on the commissioner's court, she says she would like to start a diverse task force. Successful entrepreneurs of large corporations, of small business owners, and so 
we're having constant conversations about what are the needs. The county offered a small business grant program, but it only helps 56 businesses, and another $4 million grant was made available to bars and restaurants. But DeBerry wants to know what other resources are available. Is that an increase in micro lending? Is that perhaps a bond initiative that the county undertakes where there is a continual funding stream for maybe four or five years regarding help for small businesses. Central San Antonio is one of many organizations that has helped keep small businesses afloat. They say they are happy commissioners like DeBerry are there to better represent the small businesses of San Antonio. I see um, a lot of hope um, in, in all of the county commissioners. Uh, they, they've all done an incredible job in supporting small businesses. Um, and, and I see a commitment um, overall for reaching out to them and uh, providing them with, with resources and support and capital. Daphne Gray, KSAT 12 News. Along with Trish DeBerry, Rebecca Clay Flores will also serve on the Bear County Commissioner's Court. Both women bringing new perspectives. Commissioner Kevin Wolf, who will be leaving his seat, says he's happy to see two new faces on the court. We have not had a female on the court for 20 some odd years. As a matter of fact, uh, Judge Cryer was the last female that was on court. Now to have two, uh, I think will we'll change the dynamic and I think you'll see a lot of positive things there. It's, and like I said, it's always good to get in some new perspectives. Tonight, another woman is making history. Democrat Katherine Brown will be the first black woman to serve as a Bear County constable, according to county spokesperson Monica Ramos. Brown has 19 years of, of service with the Bear County Sheriff's Office. We will hear from her coming up later in this newscast. She's got quite the story. All right, we want to get to some breaking news tonight right now. This is on the northwest side on the access road of Loop 410 near Evers Road. Police responding to a crash that involved a pedestrian in that area right now. Look, a pedestrian apparently hit on this access road. No word on injuries right now. We're going to continue to monitor the scene, but you can see that access road basically shut down right now. It's in the neighborhood in the area of 410 and Evers. An area family demanding answers after they say a video shows Schertz police arresting an 18 year old man as he cries for help on his own doorstep. The video has led to an internal investigation, but police say the man was being uncooperative. We want to warn you, some of you may find this video disturbing. The 19th Stephen Cavazos with what police and family are saying. 18-year-old Zaki Rayford screaming for his father as Shirts police arrest him outside his family's home off Kiana Place Monday. The video was released to KSAT's defenders by Rayford's family. In one video, Rayford is seen getting out of the vehicle with his hands in the air before he runs to the door. A second video shows Rayford calling for his dad before police tackle him to the ground. In the video, police are heard telling Rayford that he was under arrest and to stop resisting. One police officer is seen using a taser. Another is then seen kicking the teen as he lays on the ground screaming. The door opens and police are heard telling Rayford's family that he was under arrest after he ran. Rayford's family confronts the police officer's use of force before one says, You better relax, you're gonna get it next. Uh, I promise you, you will. The video then ends. Police say they attempted to stop him after he drove through a red light. They say he then drove off into the Wilson Preserve neighborhood before turning into the driveway. Police say Rayford then attempted to flee on foot. Rayford was charged with felony evading in a motor vehicle, resisting arrest and detention and possession of marijuana. Rayford's family denies the police's account. Rayford's family released this statement to KSAT over the incident, saying, quote, it was unjust and uncalled for and threatening and misuse of force. It just makes us feel unsafe in the community we live in, end quote. Stephen Cavasso's KSAT 12 News. Now, Rayford does have previous arrests on his record, including evading arrest, engaging in organized criminal activity, and delivery of a controlled substance. The Shirts Police Department says they have launched an internal investigation into the incident and the video you just saw to ensure all their policies and procedures are followed. We'll continue to stay on top of this story. Other top stories tonight. Skeletal remains discovered near a nursing home. Police say it happened to someone was visiting a loved one at the Rio at Mission Trails nursing home on the southeast side this morning. Those remains were found about 15 yards behind the building, but it's unclear how long those remains have been there. An identity still not released yet. SAPD is asking anyone with information to call them at 210 207 
7273. A seven car crash under investigation tonight. Police say the driver of a pickup truck hit six other vehicles after swerving on the road and eventually driving on the wrong side of the road. It happened on days of Allah near Autumn Vista. That's on the northwest side of town. Several people taken to the hospital. Police say the driver is under investigation for driving under the influence. The latest now on the case of Andre McDonald, accused of murder and tampering with evidence in the death of his wife, Andrine. He was last in court back in February for a pretrial appearance, but the pandemic has left that court case on hold. Defense attorney John Convery says he is still awaiting a decision on his request to see evidence and he questions the admissibility of several search warrants in this case. McDonald arrested last July, two days after the remains of his wife, Andrine, were found on a ranch about six miles from the couple's home. Right now, it's still a waiting game to find out when this case will go to trial. Crime Stoppers now offering a reward in an aggravated robbery. Police are looking for the armed suspect who pointed a gun at a clerk and then took off with some money. It happened last month at a Chevron Star Food Mart on Fair Avenue that's located on the southeast side. If you have any information in this case, call Crime Stoppers at 210-224-STOP. You could be eligible for a reward of up to $5,000. And coming up, another look at the race for president. Is there a turn in the tide? The latest coming from both campaigns and when we may know who won. It's coming up next on the Night Beat. It's really a race to 270 electoral votes. Here's what the Associated Press is reporting tonight. Joe Biden with 264 electoral votes. The Associated Press is declaring him the winner of Arizona. ABC News tonight is not. We're also keeping an eye on Nevada, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, and Georgia. Yeah, one of those states is all that's needed for Joe Biden to become the next president if this map holds up. President Trump, meantime, would need all four of those states that are not highlighted. We will continue to follow these results as they come in. Meantime, let's take a look at the latest coming out of Georgia tonight. This, taste, this race has tightened dramatically over the course of the past 24 hours. Just a mere 31,000 votes separating these two candidates. We're hoping to get some more results as the night goes on. Well, election night quickly turning into election week as the vote counting continues across the country. It's been back and forth since polls closed Tuesday with the president getting the first crucial victories of the night. But over the last 24 hours, the tide has turned toward Biden and the race now too close to call. ABC's Andrew Dimbert is tracking this developing story from Washington, D.C. As the votes are counted, a confident Joe Biden not declaring victory, but says a win is within his reach. I'm not here to declare that we've won, but I am here to report when the count is finished, we believe we will be the winners. The former vice president says he's ahead in Wisconsin and Michigan and feels good about Arizona and Pennsylvania. Indeed, Senator Harris and I are on track to win more votes than any ticket in the history of this country. For President Trump, on election night, his team was building momentum with wins in the all-important battleground states of Florida and Ohio. The state of Florida and his 29 electoral votes will go to Donald Trump. We are now projecting that Donald Trump will win the state of Ohio. But his window to win the White House for a second term could be closing. With Biden holding on to razor-thin leads in several crucial states, Trump still has a path to victory, but that positive outcome now appears a bit more daunting. But Trump, like Biden, believes he'll prevail. We were getting ready to win this election. Frankly, we did win this election. <laughs> The race has not been called yet, and Trump is already readying for a fight. The president meeting with aides inside the White House he hopes to hold, filing lawsuits in Michigan and Georgia, demanding a recount in Wisconsin, and joining another lawsuit in Pennsylvania over ballot deadlines. The White House press secretary telling Fox News. Let me start there by saying we're going to win outright, but should those three extra days of ballots matter, we believe we'll prevail at the Supreme Court. And this delay was to be expected and could last another day or even longer, as many states are still counting the record number of mail-in ballots. Andrew Dimber, ABC News, Washington. 
Turning now to our weather, let's take a live look outside with live cam. Another beautiful day. I love this weather. I hope we're going to get more of it. Yeah, is it though too much too nice? Like, do we need, do we, <laughs> right? do we need a little rain here and there? I'm yes, okay with we either do. option. I was going to say, <laughs> it's, okay not, either option. it's not growing season, which is no, nice. Okay, that's good. But it would be nice to give us a little bit of rain, give our soil some water, and fill up the aquifer a bit and get parts of South Texas out of drought. That would be nice. But uh, in lieu of rainfall, at least we've had some very comfortable conditions. It's going to lead to some morning fog tomorrow, so expect that for the commute. Minimal chance of rain, unfortunately, in the days of ahead, but it is still going to be pretty comfortable out there and relatively fall-like. Another cold front is on the way, and we're going to talk about that in the extended forecast. First, let's take a look at today. Started the day at 47, made it up to 80 for the high temperature. So another day with a morning well below average and an afternoon a little above average, four degrees above average in the afternoon. But record territory today is mid 90s, so obviously far from that. Now it's important to talk about the moisture in the air and the dew point. The dew point is the true measure of the amount of moisture in the air. And keep in mind, the dew point technically is the temperature that the air needs to be cooled to in order to become saturated. Well, I do think we'll get down to our dew point later on tonight. So not only will where there'll be dew on the ground, but also some areas of fog. And we also have longer nights this time of year. So it tends to be a little foggier this time of year when you have the right conditions. You have more time to develop that fog. And I am anticipating with that little resurgence of moisture in the air, that visibilities will be down a bit tomorrow morning. So here's a look at our future cast for visibility. Not a problem out there the next several hours, but closer to sunrise. That's when we expect the visibilities to drop off a little bit. Not for everybody. And I think the computer model overdoes it a little bit all across South Texas. It's not going to be everywhere necessarily, but we'll have the pockets of fog again, which will quickly burn off. Notice by 10 a.m. back to sunshine and on the topic of dew points, very comfortable through the weekend. Dewey's in the 50s. Then we get into Monday and early Tuesday. Day, and that's when you'll notice a little humidity back in the air and actually some mugginess until that next cold front hits Tuesday afternoon ish, give or take 61 at Stinson right now. Holotus is at 62, already 50s in the hill country. Comfort and Kerrville both at 54 and 67 officially at the airport in San Antonio, but 59 Carrizo Springs. So many locations already dipping down into the 50s, and I think a lot of us will be uh, in the mid 50s to start the day tomorrow. Quiet weather again today across the Lone Star State and actually the entire nation, kind of like yesterday. Very quiet weather. Upper level high, that's been dominating our weather pattern lately. There is a little disturbance just to the north of us. Now, if that disturbance had some moisture to work with and even a little instability, maybe we could have gotten some showers, but we're going to be on the wrong side of this system. All the moisture is going to be on the east side of it. So despite a disturbance coming right overhead, we just don't have everything there to really generate any showers from it. So unfortunately, our rainfall forecast is pretty bleak here. You head to Louisiana all the way down to Florida. They're going to see some decent rainfall, especially because this is going to team up with the leftovers of Hurricane Ada in the days ahead. And I'm going to talk more about that in the next half hour. Show you Ada the latest position and uh, what it's likely to do. And tomorrow morning, 54 degrees to start the day. Areas of fog. But by the noon hour, we'll be in the mid 70s and then right near 80 tomorrow afternoon with a lot of sunshine again. So, yeah, maybe a hint of a chill in the air in the morning, but the kids insist on wearing shorts and short sleeves. They'll be OK. It's going to be near 80 and a lot of sunshine later on and pretty much the same story all the way through the weekend. Lower 80 Saturday, Sunday morning temperatures rise a little bit with the extra humidity by Monday and Tuesday is that next cold front that we're expecting. Exact timing, of course, is still pretty much up in the air at some point midday into the afternoon with maybe an isolated shower or two, and it should tamp down the temperatures again a little bit for Veterans Day next week. Thank you, Adam. All right. Well, it appears this cowboy is one and done, Greg. You're talking about Danucci, as in Danucci done done, yeah. because the rookie did not work out well in his first ever start here. When we come back, what are the Cowboys' choices to replace him? We will let you know. And does J.J. Watt want to finish his career with the Texans? His answer may surprise you. Coming up. Pro 
football coverage. Powered by Davis Law Firm. The Dallas Cowboys had their fourth starting quarterback this season when they face the undefeated Steelers in Arlington late Sunday afternoon. That's because rookie Ben DiNucci is out after his rookie performance. The 23-9 loss to the Eagles in Philadelphia with a chance to take the lead in the fourth quarter. DiNucci didn't see the blitz coming, fumbles the ball, gives up the game ceiling touchdown in the process. So with DiNucci done, who will be the Cowboys quarterback this Sunday? That remains to be seen as former Longhorn and SMU quarterback Garrett Gilbert has been brought in, will compete with former Cowboys backup quarterback Cooper Rush, who's familiar with Kellen Moore's offense. Cowboys star running back Ezekiel Elliott played for three quarterbacks in the Iowa State Buckeyes, won the national championship in 2014. But this is the first time in his career he has played with four. We've had a lot of injuries this season, and uh, I mean, there's been a lot of guys in and out of there. And um, I mean, we just got to be all be ready, next man up mentality, and uh, get ready to play some ball. It's great to have Coop back. I love Coop. Uh, you know, he's a great teammate. Um, it's great to have him back out here with us. Now, some good news for the Cowboys today. No other player or staff members have tested positive for the coronavirus. After backup quarterback Andy Dalton, who is recovering from his first concussion of his career, tested positive for COVID-19 this week. The NFL trade deadline came and went without the Eastern Texans making a move, despite the fact former head coach and general manager Bill O'Brien gave up the first and second round picks next season before he was fired. There had been talk that the Texans might do J.J. Watt a favor and trade him to a contender since he only has one year left on his contract that is not guaranteed after this season. But that didn't happen. And when asked today if he sees himself finishing his career in Houston, he sounds like a man who wants to move on. I'm not looking to rebuild. I'm looking to I'm looking to go after a championship, and that's what I want to do. So um, whatever is in the best interest of the Houston Texans, that's in the best interest of myself. And so um, but like I said, I'm, I'm interested in, in winning a championship in this league. That's how every player's goal. All right, not exactly what Texan fans want to hear in the middle of a one and six season start. And when you consider all J.J. Watt has done for Houston, kickoff against the Jaguars in Jacksonville this Sunday is set for noon. The UTSA Roadrunners have traveled by bus to Houston on Friday for their game against Rice in Houston this Saturday. That's after they dropped to four and four on the year after their 24 to three loss on the road to Florida Atlantic. In that game, quarterback Frank Harris was sacked four times and the nation's leading rusher, Sincere McCormick, was held to just 54 yards. Now head coach Jeff Trailer wants this to be a November to remember in their final four. What does that mean to Harris and his teammates? It can either go good or bad for us. Uh, it could be November to remember in a good way. Uh, we win these next few games or in a bad way and we lose the next few games. So we got to go out there and just keep preparing and keep watching film and getting better. I remember Rice has only played two games this season due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Kickoff is set for 2.30 p.m. where the Owls are five-point favorites. UTA head coach Tom Herman with a shout-out to former Judson coach D.W. Rutledge next. The Texas Longhorns are back in the hunt for the Big 12 title following back-to-back -back conference victories over Baylor and previously undefeated Oklahoma State. The wins have now placed Texas at 4-2 overall, 3-2 in the Big 12, and now will face West Virginia, who come into Austin with the exact same record as the Horns, which means the winner of Saturday's showdown will continue to compete for the conference title, and the loser is out. As his weekly press conference began, UT head football coach Tom Herman wanted to send this message to former Judson head coach D.W. Rutledge, who's recovering from severe injuries in a biking accident over the week. Weekend. First and foremost, uh, sending our thoughts and prayers to uh, Coach D.W. Rutledge and uh, his family. Uh, I know Coach Rutledge was in a, a pretty nasty bicycle accident uh, on Friday, and uh, one of the legends, uh, not just in this state, but uh, in the country and in, in our sport. And uh, he's, he's in ICU right now. Uh, we're, we're checking on him daily. And um, if, if you find it in your heart, uh, I know him and uh, his family uh, certainly could use uh, your thoughts and prayers. And great news tonight after showing signs of dramatic improvement. Former Justin coach D.W. Rutledge has been released from the hospital, University Hospital to be specific. His son Clint posting on Facebook that his dad is still in pain, but home, your prayers are working. Plans are in place now for the NBA 2020-2021 season to tip off on December the 22nd and play to reduce 72-game schedule. That's according to ESPN. The reports the NBA Board of Governors and Players Association are holding separate meetings tomorrow to finalize the agreement. The league believes the December 22nd start will allow the season to end before the Summer Olympics in mid-July, where Spurs head coach Greg Popovich is scheduled to coach 
the U.S. men's team. In fact, I got to tell you, I think that will work out every season to start in December and play 72 games in a full playoff schedule. But then again, I don't own a team and I'm not paying out millions of dollars in salaries. Well, you get you don't have to compete with as many leagues at that time. Exactly. We're agreeing on something. Great. I know. I like this. It's a breakthrough. It major. Thank you, Craig. We'll be right back. <laughs> we got more breaking news we want to bring you tonight. Sky 12 over the scene of a shooting near downtown. Police say a man shot at another man near a gas station near West Elmira and Jackson. The victim is being checked out. Police are still searching for that shooter tonight, but it gives you an idea of what they're looking for. They've shut down the road. Again, this is West Elmira near Jackson. Well, the election is described as historic. It's especially true for one particular political race in Bear County. Catherine Brown, now the first black woman to become a Bear County constable. Myra Arthur and I spoke with her during our day after election live stream this evening. Here's a look. Welcome, good evening and congratulations. Good evening, how are you? We're doing great. I am so happy that you were able to join us. Uh, we talked about your race last night uh, with Bear County Commissioner Tommy Calvert, and he was very excited about this historic win. What's it like for you at this hour, a day after Election Day, compared to what it was like last night at this time? I have to tell you, it's all surreal, and I'm truly taking it in in small dosages. I'm um, truly humbled, very, very modest. And all I want to do is just go to work. <laughs> I am just ready to go to work and get the job done and, and implement you know, a couple of ideas that I have to hopefully bridge the gap and uh, skill, develop, and train my officers. What's it like for you to be a part of history? You are the first black female constable in Bear County. That moment in history now belongs to you. How does that feel? That's pretty huge. That's pretty huge. Um, all I can say is I'm honored. I, I'm truly honored. I'm very, very humbled. Um, I definitely have a lot of ambition in terms of, of uh, uh, returning interest on, on the voters' uh, faith in me. Uh, I just want to be. I just want to be a good steward of, of everyone's vote. Is, is what my plans are. Um, I have great faith, so I'm definitely uh, counting on God to um, order my footsteps in accordance to his word to do right by the community. All right, I know that you said you don't want all this fuss, you're just ready to get to work, <laughs> but I want to point out the fact that somebody could look at you as a picture of resiliency. I mean, you're a mother of two, you are an ovarian cancer survivor, you've been worth the Bear County Sheriff's Office for 19 years, you're a small yes, business owner, but the cancer survivor part, I mean, the resiliency is there. I mean, you have to admit that part. Yes, yes. Um, my mid twenties, I, I got ovarian cancer, um, did chemotherapy, surgeries, beat it, and then when I um, got out of the sheriff's office, uh, three years into my career, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And um, during that process, I was like, you know what? Cancer is just a word. It's not a sentence. And so during the process in which I was receiving my chemotherapy treatments, I just do a uh, study and test for a corporal. And I made it and um, that was the, the, I guess the initiation phase of me ranking up within the sheriff's office. That's amazing. So pretty, pretty profound. Yeah, cancer is a word, not a sentence. I don't think I've heard that before. <laughs> I like that. I want to get your take on this. You obviously you've been in law enforcement for quite some time. Uh, you're coming into a, a position of leadership in law enforcement after we have seen months of unrest uh, when it comes to conversations about racial inequality, about police reform. What is it like going to be like if you have any predictions, what that will be like for you to be in this position now as a member of the black community at the same time. What's pretty awesome is that um, I've gone out on the campaign trail and I've had these conversations. And one thing about me, I am a fighter, as you guys know, with the cancer and all, so I'm not afraid to face any controversial issues. And what I found was that's all the community wants. They want a listening ear. They just want a listening ear and they want some type of solutions. And what I've also learned is that never have too much pride to say, you know what, 
That's a good question. Um, I don't have the solution, but you know what? I'll research it. And just don't say you're gonna research it, but come back to them and give them the results. That's all they want. That's all they want. And um, when I would go to the rallies, I've gone to a lot of uh, violence um, in the community rallies. And um, basically what, what I found was they did not know that the sheriff's office or the police departments had an internal affairs. I had no idea, no idea. They thought that basically at the initial contact of a law enforcement officer, that that's the extent of it, or the supervisor of a law enforcement officer, that that was the extent of their complaint. They never knew that there was a higher entity that could possibly uh, investigate um, what they were trying to get resolved. So when I was out on the campaign trail, I would give them those resources and say, hey, you know, if you can't get it resolved on the lower level, just, you know, open up a, a internal affairs um, request and go that route. That's what it's there for. Give me one thing that you want to accomplish as constable. I definitely want to bridge that gap. You know, um, unfortunately, due to the current affairs and such, the community has lost a lot of faith uh, within law enforcement. Um, I know that there's a protect and serve aspect to become a great law enforcement officer. And I definitely want that equilibrium, you know, when carrying out my duties as well as my officer's duties. Um, that's my first uh, order of business. And um, I also want to assure the community that, you know, the officers in which I am in charge of will be skilled, developed and trained um, in accordance to what uh, uh, law enforcement policy and procedures pertain to and as well as what the community's needs. There has to be that equal balance. It just won't work any other way. Um, I come from a great, great agency, the Bear County Sheriff's Office. I'm so proud that uh, Sheriff Salazar and also uh, Leticia uh, Vasquez um, won. So I come from good stock. So I want to bring a lot of the community resources that I've learned and acquired there and um, bring them over to the, the constable's office. So that's some of my little ideas. Little ideas. Not so little. <laughs> yeah, sounds like big plans. <laughs> Catherine Brown, newly elected constable, Bear County Precinct 4, thanks for your time and congratulations. You're welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for making time for us. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Have a great night. Fascinating woman. Yeah. Just a like double that. cancer yeah. survivor. Still ahead on the night beat, the coronavirus continues to grip the U.S. with the rise in cases. What an internal memo is revealing about its impact and the latest on the race for a vaccine. And as the counting of ballots continues in the race for the White House, there are legal challenges in play. The latest coming up. Want to update some breaking news we brought you at the top of this newscast. We're learning a crash has turned deadly on the access road of Blue 410 near Evers Road. This is on the northwest side. Police now saying a man was riding a motorcycle when he rear-ended a car and died at the scene. No word on the man's identity. Officers only describing him as a man in his 30s. Again, this was a motorcycle accident involved in this whole thing. We'll continue to monitor for any new developments. Making headlines around America tonight, the United States became the first country to officially exit the Paris Climate Accord today. The landmark agreement between 189 countries to protect the planet, the final draft of the agreement announced back in 2015. All of the other world's major superpowers and top greenhouse gas emitters are still part of the agreement. Under its terms, a country can't leave the agreement until one year after signaling plans to withdraw. Today marks a year to the day. The U.S. said it wanted out of these, this accord. Well, Democratic activist Sarah McBride is set to become America's first ever transgender state senator. She is projected as the winner in the Delaware race, overwhelmingly beating Republican candidate Steve Washington. McBride formerly served as a spokesperson for the Human Rights Campaign. The win would also make her Delaware's first out LGBTQ person elected to the state's legislature. Again, let's check in on the race for president. The latest results from the Associated Press. Again, the AP is projecting Joe Biden to win Arizona. 
ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, they have not called that race yet. The candidate who reaches 270 will become president. If this map holds, Biden would just need one more state to reach that goal. But as ABC's Marcy Gonzalez reports, legal challenges are already taking place. With millions of ballots left to be counted, the president falsely claiming victory and promising a legal battle. His team already filing suit in several states, one in Georgia seeking to order Chatham County to store and account for all ballots received after the polls closed. Another suit in Michigan seeks to stop ballot counting there, claiming the campaign hasn't been given meaningful access to some counting locations. And early Wednesday morning, the president going even further. Be going to to the U.S. Supreme Court, we want all voting to stop. Legal experts say at this point, the Supreme Court will not get involved in the way the president wants. What the Supreme Court can't do and won't do is literally stop the counting. In Pennsylvania, the decision to allow ballots mailed on or before Election Day to be counted if they arrive by Friday, still facing legal challenges. The president's lawyers filing with the Supreme Court seeking to join a pending lawsuit on the issue, writing, this court, not the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, should have the final say. The state's attorney general disagrees. Two separate occasions, the Supreme Court didn't step in. This should remain with the state, and the state says these ballots should be counted. The Supreme Court could also possibly rule on matters involving potential recounts, as we saw in Florida in 2000. Once ballots in this election are all tallied, the count in some states could be so tight it would likely trigger automatic recounts. In others, the candidates can request them, which we're already seeing in Wisconsin. Though the votes are still being tallied, President Trump's campaign manager writes in a statement that they have serious doubts about the validity of the results there, adding the president is well within the threshold to request request a recount and we will immediately do so. Joe Biden's legal team, meanwhile, has said they are prepared to defend the vote and make sure every eligible ballot is counted. Marcy Gonzalez, ABC News, Wilmington, Delaware. Live cam tonight, 67 degrees out there. This is, I, I love these days where it, warms up just you know upper 70s just enough yes just, enough. Yes. just nicely yeah comfortable and crisp in the morning and then we really get that thermometer rising during the day and it levels off very nicely so we topped out at 80 degrees today that was after morning low of 47 so it's one of those days where we had the wide ranging temperatures and the aquifer actually bumped up a little bit today it's not pumping season anymore so you see these little fluctuations upward even without rainfall sometimes but we're still almost eight feet below the november average and by the way stage one watering restrictions. Mold, the only allergen reported, and it's low at 190. All right, let's take a look across the Lone Star State. Very similar readings, 50s and 60s out there. Pretty uneventful, not just for us, but across the entire nation. There really isn't a huge temperature contrast uh, north to south right now. You look closely at South Texas, 52 Kerrville, 50 in Fredericksburg, Victoria at 58 degrees. Meanwhile, 67 at the International Airport in town and 63 in Uvalde and even Del Rio at 66. Now dew points are going to hold pretty steady in the 50s, but our air temperatures are going to drop down to those dew points. In turn, I do think visibility will become a little bit of an issue for the morning commute tomorrow. Some developing fog, not for everybody, and I, I know the future cast shows everybody gray across all of South Texas. I don't anticipate it to be quite this widespread, but there will be some pockets of fog to start the day tomorrow. So anticipate that with some reduced visibility for the first part of the morning commute. Notice by 10 a.m. It's all gone. We should burn it off pretty quickly, just like we did earlier this morning and have a lot of sunshine. Another beautiful, comfortable day in store. So you look at Texas, you see some clouds to the north and even moving over the Mississippi River. It's actually associated with a little disturbance, this little dip in the upper level flow. This is the same one I talked about on Monday that was causing showers in the desert southwest. It just doesn't have anything to work with here. So unfortunately, it's not dropping any rainfall. And despite there being a good amount of moisture, in the Caribbean, which will be stretching into the Gulf. Unfortunately, I don't think we'll be able to tap into any of that. This is what's left of Hurricane Ada, now Tropical Depression Ada. It made landfall about 36 hours ago 
as a category four in the northeastern corner of Nic Nicaragua there. So it was a major storm. Now, luckily, it's weakened, but it's like, likely to become a subtropical or hybrid storm at about tropical storm strength as it reemerges over the Caribbean and moves toward Florida gradually over the next five days. And basically, it's just going to have a lot of rain associated with it with a few gusty winds. But right now, not looking like a big deal. Honestly, I wish we could get the remnants of that because it'd mean good rainfall and that would be it. It's just not in the works. So tomorrow morning, sunrise, a little bit of fog, 50, 54 degrees, then sunny and right near 80 for the high temperature. No big changes. We just warm a few degrees this weekend and a cold front's likely by Tuesday of next week. And that could uh, drop our temperatures again just a bit as we get into the middle part of next week. Thank you, Adam. The coronavirus taking center stage in this historic election. A look at the numbers and the race for a vaccine. Next on the Night Beat. While the election continues to grab headlines, the pandemic has not gone away. Cases, hospitalizations and deaths are rising across much of the country as the race for a vaccine continues. ABC's Rena Roy with the latest. As the fight for the White House continues, so does the battle against the coronavirus. The contentious election and deadly global pandemic colliding in this momentous time in history, impacting decisions at the polls. The fact that so many people supported the man who did not lead us during the coronavirus is outrageous. He's a much better choice than Biden. He, America first, there you go. An internal HHS memo obtained by ABC News shows new coronavirus cases increased 19% from the week before. This is another critical moment for action. Another critical moment for leaders to step up. That memo also says medical facilities in Utah are reaching a breaking point and that doctors may have to start prioritizing care for patients based on age and condition. In Utah County, NICU nurse Patrice Grossman died after complications from the coronavirus. Wear the mask. Wear it. Really? If not for you, then for others because... My mom was gone in 24 hours. The U.S. continues to make history with an average of 80,000 new cases reported daily, according to the COVID tracking project. Health experts say it may be a good idea to quarantine if you voted at the polls in a hot spot. If you're in a hot zone, um, if you're in a crowded area where, again, the distancing measures might not have been um, well implemented, absolutely, um, by all means, go ahead and do that. But it is not an official recommendation. Meantime, in the race for a vaccine, officials in the UK say the one being developed by AstraZeneca could have results from its late stage trials by the end of this year, but it is still unclear when exactly the vaccine will be rolled out. Rena Roy, ABC News, New York. As the number of COVID-19 cases grows, so does the need to reduce the spread of influenza. Health experts say that means getting a flu shot. 12 on your sides, Marilyn Moritz says there our options to get one safely. As seasons change, the coronavirus isn't the only health worry. There's also the flu. I feel so nervous because we we have two virals at the same time during fall and winter. Because there's not yet an approved vaccine against COVID-19, doctors are recommending with more urgency than ever that people get their flu shot now. So the flu shot won't reduce your risk of getting COVID-19, but it will cut your risk of getting the flu. And even if you do get the flu, if you've had the flu shot, you're also less likely to get severely sick or need to be hospitalized. <coughs> If you get sick, diagnostic testing can help determine if it's flu or COVID. Even if your flu test is positive, it is still possible to have COVID-19 at the same time. The flu shot takes about two weeks to become fully effective. Same for kids. Doctors recommend children six months and older get their flu shot soon. As for where, you have options. Your local pharmacy can have you in and out for the flu shot in really just a few minutes. And then doctor's offices and clinics are doing various things to make sure flu shots are safe too. So that might be drive up clinics or special hours that are just for flu shots. The main thing is to call ahead to find out what's going on. When I went to get my flu shot, I felt very safe. I made an appointment and the place was following all the safety protocols. 
If you have symptoms of respiratory virus, contact your doctor. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. And just a reminder, our KSAT community partner, University Health, is helping with a series of flu shot drives this month. Your first chance is coming up this Saturday from 8 a.m. to noon at the Dub Ferris Athletic Complex. That is located in the 8400 block of Northwest Loop 1604 West. This is one of several flu shot drives. Most major insurance plans will be accepted and people without insurance can still get a shot for free. You do need to have an appointment to receive a flu shot though. We have a link to register on ksatcommunity.com. We'll be right back. Before we leave you tonight, I want to take another look at the race for the White House where almost every state that you see in gray on this map the race seems to be tightening one way or the other. Even the state of Arizona that's blue on this map, the Associated Press calling Arizona for Vice President Joe Biden, that race is also tightening. Again, the goal is 270 electoral votes. If you give Joe Biden Arizona, he just needs one more of those other four states to hit 270 or go above it. We have much more election coverage on our website, ksat.com. You can check out other county, state, and U.S. races we've tracked as well. And you can also keep tabs on the presidential race. You can find it on the homepage at ksat.com. And certainly tonight, it does not seem as if we are going to have a winner declared in any of those states we've been talking about, you know, in the next, what, 55 minutes. We, yeah, <laughs> hopefully tomorrow, some some progress in terms of getting these ballots counted. Yeah, it, yeah. that's hopeful. I, you know, <laughs> I'm yeah. hoping too, exactly. And the weather will be agreeable. Just so they get it right. Good night. <laughs>